Well, welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and we have a very special episode today because I'm here with, well, what's, what can I say? Noted author, TV personality, the king of barbecue and grilling, Stephen Raiklin. Thank you so much for being here, Stephen, and uh, uh, welcome to Pizza Quest. Well, Peter, thank you. I, of course, am a great fan of your work, so uh, it's uh, it's nice to be on this Zoom together. Well, you know, it's, we've in our our paths have crossed periodically over the years, uh, sometimes just inadvertently. Uh, but uh, one thing I mentioned in an email to you is that I was present way back. I think it was one of your earliest books. I, I think it was Miami Spice. You won an IACP award. And that was the first time that you came on my radar. And I was kind of new to the whole culinary scene. We're talking about 1993, I'm thinking, or 1994. Well, yeah 94 yeah the book came out in 93 and that and that and that was before the barbecue bible which is why we're gathered today because we're going to celebrate with you today the 25th anniversary of probably your most well-known book the barbecue bible which has sold millions of copies and uh you know established you as the go-to person uh on all things grilling barbecue and has led to a whole lot of other stuff but so back then 93 ish 94 you know, I, we were all just kind of getting started and getting on the general culinary radar. Um, but that wasn't the beginning of your story and your journey. And I was kind of hoping you could give us a little backstory. How did you end up getting into barbecue and grilling as sort of your thing and all the other books that you've written in between? Did you start out as a writer? Were you a chef? I know you had some culinary training in France, but how did it all begin for you? Uh, well, it all began uh, at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, where I got a degree in French literature. And uh, <laughs> I took a wrong turn and sort of <laughs> wound up in barbecue. No, but uh, at, at Reed, I, uh, I majored in French literature. I wrote my thesis on a medieval poet named Christine de Pizan, who turned out to be uh, Europe's first feminist. Although being a clueless 20-year-old, that message mostly uh, went over my head. Uh, but while I was doing my research, I came across a medieval cookbook. Uh, it was called The Form of Curry, written in uh, the uh, 1370s. Wow. And I was so intrigued by the idea that people were writing cookbooks, you know, 700 years ago. So I, uh, I'm, I proposed, I applied for a Watson Foundation Fellowship. Now, Thomas Watson founded IBM. Oh. Uh, scholarships were created in his uh, honor. And I proposed to study medieval cooking in Europe. And there may have been a few bottles of Retsina that uh, helped me <laughs> yeah. write the proposal. But at any rate, quite astonishingly, uh, I received uh, a grant from the Watson Foundation to study medieval cooking in Europe. That got me to France. It got me to uh, kind of studying the history of food and the intersection of food and history and culture, which is really what's driven my career for the last 40 years. Um, a typical medieval recipe uh, ran something like take this, that, and the other combined <laughs> in the customary fashion. Well, I didn't know what the customary fashion was. So I figured I'd better go to cooking school and, you know, at least kind of get an understanding of the process of cooking, which is what led me to uh, La Varenne, uh, the uh, World of Cuisine La Varenne and Cordon Bleu. With Anne and, Willard. Uh, yeah, with Ann Willen, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. One of the great and, cooking teachers and, of our era. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, that that really kind of launched things. I decided I wanted to be a food writer. Uh, so I came back to the U.S. I wrote one story for the Washington Post where I had a connection that was accepted. I wrote one story for the uh, Oregonian, you know, my yeah. newspaper of Portland, Oregon. That was accepted. <laughs> And I wrote a story for our local hippie uh, uh, suburban, our, our local hippie underground weekly, and then right. column in the weekly, and uh, and then I was a food writer. Well, uh, you know, it's funny how so many people found their way into food through you know unexpected avenues. Uh, you, I mean, if as I was reading your your bio, you weren't even born in the United States, or you were born in Japan. Is that correct? Yeah, in Nagoya, Japan. My father was in the service, and. Uh, my mom came over to visit and I came nine months later. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, I did not spend a lot of time in Japan. Uh, 
on that particular trip, but I guess subconsciously or subliminally, it gave me a taste for travel. And I've, of course, have been back to Japan many times, uh, including a battle with the Iron Chef. Uh, oh yeah, right. You you beat an Iron Chef, didn't you? I, I beat I uh, not only an Iron Chef. I beat the meanest, fiercest, <laughs> most scary Iron Chef around, Rocco oh, Chiba. Yeah, that was uh that was pretty amazing. Well, we gotta we gotta find out what did you beat him? How did you beat him? What was the secret ingredient? And what did you do that kind of uh, won the judges over for you? Well. Uh, uh, the uh, I, I did, you know, he did this very elaborate thing. It was like a kind of created a mini volcano and he had hundred dollar a piece uh, exotic mushrooms and abalone and lobster. And uh, I did barbecued uh, baby back ribs and chicken. <laughs> And I actually got the uh, Japanese judges to eat with their fingers, which in, in Japan is completely unheard of. And uh, my assistant was my stepson, Jake, who's a uh, six foot tall and drop dead gorgeous. And uh, <laughs> I think that he helped uh, sway the judges as much as uh, anything I did. But, Many uh, factors in play there. So, But was the theme that you had to do everything over like open fire cooking? Yeah, or... oh, uh, everything over live fire. That's right. Wow. I got to get that episode now. I didn't even realize. I uh, So that was on the original Japanese version of Iron Chef, not the American version. <laughs> Right, right, right. Well, actually, it was on a show called Barry Barry World uh, World Views, and it was a, um, it was a, a they they styled it as the uh, a competition of the barbecue gods. I guess the Japanese are uh, <laughs> given to uh, hyperbole, and uh, I, it it was you know it was it was uh, the, the the judges were primarily teenage girls believe it or not and uh what they had done is they had these rigged up these lucite tubes and given everybody either pink or blue uh ping pong balls and the audience kind of uh voted with the ping pong balls and my ping pong balls were in a higher column than uh machiba's was so i promptly decided to retire from competition uh you know iron chef competitions we, and well, machiba, <laughs> right machiba knew only one word and that word was rematch so anyway. <laughs> well but you never had a rematch with him right never had a rematch you know uh, uh, they got to leave him wanting that now so was he after after the show was over was he did he soften up a little bit was he still a mean guy nah he was a pussycat he was very, very <laughs> friendly and he invited us into the restaurant and served us a spectacular look i i'm not a chef i'm a writer it's what's on my passport it's kind of how i define my being in the world and in fact if a day goes by and i haven't written something i don't feel like i've earned an honest day's work even though i might have made a tv show or yeah you know taught a class but uh and you know the fact that i won this thing honestly was a complete fluke and uh i'm happy to have the victory but you know be under no illusion i i could no more get into a busy restaurant on a saturday night and come out alive than you know i could scale mount everest yeah, but those are the kind of, you know, like uh, moments, but peak moments when when you can say, you know, you went on, not only got to beat an Iron Chef, you actually went on the Iron Chef show in Japan, which has got to be intimidating. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who would probably melt just under the pressure of being there. Uh, so that oh. must have been intense and fun. It was intense and fun. It was pretty intimidating. Yeah, they and they had a little American flag up on my station, and the, <laughs> that it was, it was stuck up with poor uh, with bad Scotch tape or something. It kept falling down, and I thought, gee, I hope this is not an omen. Anyway, <laughs> right. yeah. no, that was their, that was them trying to get into your head, <laughs> into my head. It, it was great, and uh, but you know, my beat really, uh, Peter, over the last twenty years, and you know barbecue was certainly not what i started writing about i was a restaurant right. critic for boston magazine i was a wine mm -hmm. and spirits columnist for gq magazine but once i got into barbecue the niche i really carved out uh is i guess what i call now planet barbecue and it's it's really this idea of global grilling i have circumnavigated the globe probably seven or eight times in in the process of researching various books and uh and that's really what fascinates me is, you know, because grilling, it's it's universal. Almost every culture does it, but almost every culture does it differently. And yeah, and what fascinated me is to 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 watch those differences. Well, that that's I think, you know, what's wonderful and unique about your book, too, is, is that 
you know, I, I think of you as sort of a, a barbecue omnivore. You know, you're not, you're, you, if you live in North Carolina, where I am right now, it's hard to have uh, uh, an objective conversation about barbecue with somebody because they have a very specific, narrow idea of barbecue being a particular kind of, you know, pulled pork, uh, you know, style. And uh, when you try to open, for instance, a couple nearby, there's a place that's open doing all the different styles. And um, and a lot of people have a hard time uh, supporting that because it, it violates their ethic, which is barbecue is the way we know it here in North Carolina. But what you brought, I think, to the front for everybody was the realization that barbecue as a concept is universal and it manifests in many different ways. And then your book celebrates that. Absolutely. And it really is a universal language. And, you know, in an age when there's a Starbucks, a Starbucks on every third street corner, not only in North America, but, you know, in Korea and South Africa and France, uh, it's it's really some of the la truly last regional food around. And uh, that has really sustained my interest and passion for a lifetime. Well, you mentioned that you were writing in Boston. So you 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 somehow you ended up going to college in, in Portland at Reed. Uh, but then uh, flipped over to the East Coast. So how how did you? What was the journey that got you to Boston? Because that's where I went to uh, college, and and uh, I, you know I I I kind of found myself learning how to cook in a in a kitchen at a vegetarian restaurant in Boston back Which in one? It was called Route One Cafe. R O T okay. Route One Cafe. It was gone by 1974, but sure. during those three years, I that's where I basically learned how to use a walk, and you know we were doing all sorts of cool you know, organic, we were the early organic guys, but that, but Boston was where, you know, I kind of started out myself. So, and when you said underground paper, I immediately thought of, you know, like Boston under underground, or there, was, uh, there was Boston after dark and there was the Boston Phoenix, which were two <laughs> weekly underground magazines. I don't know if you, if you were writing for them at all, but. Uh, I, I did write for the Phoenix, but let's really play uh, the history here. It was the real paper. If you remember the real paper, the real paper. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That came. Yeah. And then, and of course I was gone from Boston from about, I think around 1974, I started my more, you know, my, my, my journey, my yeah. quest for, for the meaning of life. And, uh, but it all kicked off there in Boston, but I supported myself for, uh, during those poverty days by selling uh, for 25 cents a copy copies of the Phoenix and Boston after dark and later the real paper, you know, just on the street corners. And that's how a lot of people survived was selling, selling these uh, weekly papers. And I don't know if you had this experience. My first two years as a uh, freelance writer, I think I made $4,000 a year. And it's the <laughs> only two years of my whole life where I felt like I had everything I wanted. Oh, wow. Wow. So what, what brought you to Boston though? Well, uh, so after Reed, I won this Watson Foundation Fellowship. I spent two years in Europe, uh, primarily in France. Uh, and then I moved back to Boston, actually, uh, with a girlfriend who went to Harvard Law School. And that's where I began my freelance writing career. Uh, the relationship didn't uh, last, but, you know, Boston was a great place to be in the uh, 1970s and 80s. Uh, the first the first uh, flowering of uh, regional New England cuisine, uh, some of the legends of uh, of legendary chefs, uh, Lydia Shire, Jasper yeah. White. Also, Jean-Georges von Gerichten. I uh, think I was the first critic to ever write him up. He was the chef of the Swiss Hotel. And I didn't then, realize uh, that he got that he kind of did a Boston yeah. thing. Yeah, before he became yeah. the Mr. You know, everywhere chef. <laughs> you know? Really? Yeah. Um, so, so that was a good time to be in Boston and, 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 and in a lot of cities, that was sort of the early stages of the culinary awakening in America. Um, and, and you, had you already studied at La Varenne or is that, did that come later? No, I, I did my year at La Varenne and Cordon Bleu. That was, uh, uh, right after college, you know, that was during my Watson year. So you already had the language and the frame of reference for what was going on in the culinary scene. So you could, you could not only write about it, but really, you know, understand it from the inside out. I did. And, you know, it would you know, sort of one of the great debates is, uh, does does a critic need to know how to cook to be a good critic? Uh -huh. And I believe that, you know, knowledge is a good thing. And you really do need to, if you know, the more you know about the process, the better a critic you are. And, you know, there are other schools of thought that say, well, the, the average diner is not necessarily schooled in food although i think that's very different now i think people that's the knowledge about food 
on the American public today is it's, it's huge. Uh, the ingredients we know about, the process, how much people cook at home. Uh, but that was not the case when I was reviewing restaurants uh, in the 70s. Well, well, uh, reviewing restaurants is a great way to expand, I think, uh, anyone's culinary palate and 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 I coming up with the right words and the way to you know frame the conversation uh, is is a, an art form in itself. But it, for me, I, I got to do when I was just starting out, not knowing that I was not culinary school trained or anything. I was learned by just doing. Um, but one of the ways that I that I grew my vocabulary and my palate was to go and, and do local restaurant reviews for back in, by then I was living in California and there was an under, not an underground paper, but a weekly paper. Um, and they, they needed a writer to do restaurants and I couldn't afford to eat at restaurants, but they, they covered that, you know, so I got to go to restaurants and see what was going on. And suddenly I was developing a whole new vocabulary, which uh, helped me to appreciate other people's writings. When, when I would read the reviews in, whether it was gourmet magazine or Bon Appetit or, you know, anywhere that it, it, was, it was a whole world opening up through the language of food. And I, th I think that's what you, you know, kind of also did. But it, so you you started out with that and you kind of were paying your dues. But then somehow you ended up going from Boston down to Miami. What what pu pulled you to Miami? Uh, again, it was another woman. Uh, <laughs> it all it starts was, with that. <laughs> right, I'll be behind every man, great man, right? Uh, yeah. No, uh, the, my current wife, actually. And we had a long distance ten, uh, relationship for 10 years. And then finally, uh, I uh, proposed on bended knee, I might add. And uh, you would appreciate this being in uh, in uh, in the uh, bread and baking field. So uh, she had always said she wanted a two carat ring with uh, step down baguettes. So when I proposed, I had a French baguette brought to the table with two carrots standing upright in it. Oh, wow. Uh, Yes, what a romantic, what a romantic. Very nice, very. very... Any anyway, rate, uh, but Miami, you know, Miami was great getting down here. I was here at the right time, right place, the whole new Floridian cuisine thing with exactly. Mark Botello yeah, and Norman Bates. were there like, when, when Boston was having its flowering, but then Miami, but uh, South Florida was really a happening place then in the culinary world. Absolutely exploded. So I, uh, I proposed a book called uh, Miami Spice. Yeah. To Workman Publishing. Actually, at that at the time, I called it hot food exclamation mark, which looking back on it was about, you know, possibly the worst title. Uh, <laughs> actually, the second worst title. The worst title was the original, my original working title for the Barbecue Bible. But Workman, uh, they finally uh, they bought the book. They changed it to Miami Spice. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was my first, you know, big uh well-selling cookbook with a book tour and you know it introduced me to peter workman and a relationship with the publishing house publishing house that is still going strong 25 years later yeah they were very important publishers uh, uh for the culinary world and uh, uh and and came out with I, what i what i viewed as sort of heavy recipe driven books i mean your books were not just you know like 120 pages of this it was loaded like hundreds of pages of recipes, 500 recipes or something like that. And uh, certainly in, in some of them, the Barbecue Bible has at least 500 recipes, right? It does. Yeah. Peter Workman, back at the time, he used to love what he called uh, category killers. And a category killer was the ultimate definitive word on the subject. You know, a book so big that you could, you know, if you were short, you could sit on it to uh, the, the, put children on it to sit up right at the table. And uh, Barbecue Bible was... You know, and when I started Barbecue Bible, I thought it was going to be, okay, it'd be 100 recipes, you know, I'll visit 10 countries, I'll kind of yeah. knock it out in a year. It took four years to write, grew to uh, 500 plus recipes. I actually wrote four books in the interim to pay for the research for Barbecue Bible, but wow. it um, it came out, it was the right book, the right time, and, you know, it, it exploded. And it's the fact that it's still in print is, uh, I, I am awestruck and humbled. Well, uh, we're coming up to a break, and I and I but I and I want to spend this, our our second segment with you, focusing more on on the barbecue Bible. But you did say that uh, in addition to your early PBS shows or you know with public television, you've got a new series now. Is this like your your fifth iteration of a of a uh, uh, a cooking series for PBS? 
It is. Uh, it's called Planet Barbecue. Planet Barbecue. Yeah, that's, so that's barbecue. what people. It's actually the full name is Stephen Reichland's Planet Barbecue, but uh, it <laughs> launches on May twenty seventh, uh, and um, the you know it's a how to barbecue show, but it's much more internationally focused. We have episodes on Argentina, uh, on Brazil, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, we have several shows on kind of cross-cultural and trans uh, transatlantic barbecue, uh, lots of guests, lots of field trips, uh, but also plenty of segments where I'm sort of demonstrating my way of doing barbecuing and grilling. And we taped in San Antonio. It was really fun shoot. So uh, I hope some of that fun comes through on the uh, in the shows. Well, I'm sure it will because you've had a lot of experience now creating these shows and they're all they've all been very popular and uh, and educational. I mean, you know, I, when I watch your shows, I always leave every episode with a new trick or technique or or just get fired up about a particular flavor you know, profile that you've exposed. So let's talk about that, because, you, you know, you I'm sure that uh, the Barbecue Bible, which also is this, in a sense, the prelude to to uh, Planet Barbecue, you could all um the barbecue Bible could have just as easily been called Planet Barbecue because that seems to be what the theme of the book is. Um, so let's explore what that is and and maybe uh, pick your brain a little bit for uh, for some of your most frequently asked questions and the things that you know that get you excited and still are keeping you excited as you continue to explore this. I guess you could say this uh, vein of uh, that that opened up when you when you discovered barbecue and grilling as a subject matter that is a, is the gift that keeps on giving because you just never run out of ideas and and books to write about so i want to find out all about that when we come back in part two uh you're with us today everybody on pizza quest with Stephen reichland so today we're really on barbecue quest we're on we're on the the quest for the the planetary uh what's the word the 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 secret sauce of what makes barbecue the most global universal of all foods we'll be back in just a moment welcome back to pizza quest with peter reinhardt and i'm with stephen raikland today the acclaimed author of the barbecue bible and also the about to launch planet barbecue tv series which by the time this show airs will already be on the air in what on a public uh, television uh, station? Public television, yeah, public television uh, network. Uh, more than three hundred and fifty stations across the country. Wow! So I'll be uh, I'll be looking forward to to that. And uh, uh, you said that you uh, recorded that and uh, all put it all together down in San Antonio. Why San Antonio? Well, you know, the theme of Planet Barbecue, obviously, it's a cr cross-cultural uh, trends in barbecue and grilling. And San Antonio is it, it's one of the ultimate cross-cultural uh, cities in North America. I mean, it's uh, more than 50 percent of the uh, population speaks Spanish and identifies with Mexico. Uh, it's also the uh, southern extreme of the uh, of the, the, the southern border of uh, traditional Texas hill country barbecue. So mm -hmm. it just seemed like a perfect location for uh, Planet Barbecue. Can you give us a, a little uh, foretaste of some of the, the the themes or recipes or techniques you're going to be covering in the series? Absolutely. Well, our first uh, show uh, is our Argentina show. And we actually have a dish that will be uh, near and dear to your heart, I think. It's uh, called a beef pizza. Now, wow. instead of a pizza crust, it's actually a butterfly flank steak uh, that gets the pizza toppings. Oh, my uh, God. But it's uh, truly amazing. And we uh, worked with a wonderful Brazilian uh, grill master, uh, Argentinian grill master, I'm sorry, uh, named Al Frugoni. Uh, and uh, I, I, it, it's a really cool show. Let's see. Number two is uh, grilling from across the pond. And that was a show that explored the cross-cultural uh, links of barbecue in the old world, barbecue in the new world. You know, uh, people uh, think about the Mexican influence in Texas, but there was a huge German influence in Texas. Uh, German uh, brewers came over, started the first brewery in San Antonio in the late 1800s. Uh, so we have a dish that's called a uh, Spießbraten. It's a traditional stuffed uh, pork roast that is spit roasted over a beechwood fire from the wow. Zarbrücken region in uh, Germany. And we reimagined it using Texas ingredients. 
uh, and uh, working over a mesquite fire in the Lone Star State. Interesting. So, yes. so you you really take like let's say a traditional ideas, but then add your own twist to it. These a lot of these sound like they're your own original sort of uh, innovations on top of an existing concept. Well, I would say it's a mixture of both. We certainly do traditional barbecue, and that was maybe even more true in my uh, earlier shows like um, Project Smoke and Project Fire, where we really tried to show the authentic traditional way to do it. And there's plenty of authentic traditional barbecue in Planet Barbecue, too. But uh, there also is, is a lot of, uh, I guess, what you might call cross-cultural inspirations or fusions. Uh, another one, you know, if you're uh, if you're jonesing for a dessert, I call <laughs> it, uh, it's a, a smoked torched uh, creme brulee. So uh, the idea of creme brulee, you know, which despite yeah. it's originated in England, uh, not in France, but <laughs> this particular one, instead of uh, baking the custard in the oven, we uh, cook it in a smoker. So it acquires a smoke flavor. Nice. Uh, and of course, they have, you know, the blowtorch to uh, to caramelize the sugar crust on top. It's pretty neat. That must be uh, that makes sense when you think about it. And that the, that the smoker is probably at a low enough temperature that you can create that custard and keep it creamy and not curdly, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah, we're working at 250 degrees, you know, for for our smoking temperature. So yeah. no problem with uh, curdling the eggs. Well, you know, you've written 31 books. When we talk, I mean, everyone th thinks of you maybe initially as the Barbecue Bible and maybe, you know, a couple of the other books that you, but you've done 31 books over the years. Um, all, I don't know if they're all, you know, outgrowths of the of the barbecue and grilling model, but how do you, how do you keep coming up with fresh new ideas for that? Because that's a lot of books. Yeah, well, actually, uh, it's uh, I think since the last time I updated my biography, it's 32 books now. 32. Uh, wow. And one of them is a novel uh, called. Oh, that's uh, right. Right. The Hermit of Chappaquiddick, which is yeah. uh, that I am mixed, you know, was it was tremendously satisfying to write. And I'm very proud of and it's available uh, on Amazon. If people want to see the softer, kinder, gentler side of Stephen Reichland, yeah. the, uh, the I, wonder, I wanted to ask you about that because I noticed I saw that, it, that you had this this novel. What was that like for you as a writer? I know for all writers, you know, every, every writer wants to write the great American novel, no matter how successful our nonfiction is, we all want to, you know, do something in fiction. What was it like for you to, to cross that line? You know, it was uh, one of the uh, most rewarding experiences and one of the best years of my life. My editor at Workman had taken a leave of absence. So uh, basically for a year, I had a free year and I had this idea uh, floating around in my head. Uh, it's set on uh, Chappaquiddick Island in Martha's Vineyard, wow. uh, which is actually where I live in the summer. And uh, I knew how it would begin. I knew how it would end. And uh, but I didn't know what would happen in the middle. So I started writing. I wrote a chapter, then I wrote a second chapter. And <laughs> by the third chapter, I said, hey, to my wife, I said, hey, Barbara, you know, I think I'm going to write a novel. And it took me six months to write the first draft. It took me another three years to, you know, do drafts two through nine. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and it's a, you know, it's a foodie love story is what it is. There's no barbecue in it. There are no recipes in it because I didn't want people to think of it as another cookbook but there's a strong food element uh and it was uh it was great great fun uh i am not the hermit of chappaquiddick but there are uh, many little uh autobiographical details in it did you um in the writing a novel is not an easy thing to do i mean it's a, it's 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 a I don't know. It takes a skill a skill set that not everybody can do you know there's certainly uh, lots of um critics of literature who are critics because they they were failed novelists they couldn't get it you know couldn't get over that hump so it's hard to get a book not only written and but then also published uh, did you work with like uh, writers groups did you have a uh, uh, people to uh, workshop your you know and kick ideas back and forth or did you just go it totally solo well I had a lot of um a lot of experts that I talked to and interviewed in fields that I was not knowledgeable in this particular novel, there's some uh, legal issues, there's a, a trial, uh, there's a, also a very quirky, real life, iconoclastic uh, psychotherapist named Wilhelm Reich. Uh, oh, yeah. 
who really existed. And he was the, uh, the, the kind of father of all the expressive therapies that were so popular uh, in the uh, last yeah. century, like primal scream and the organ uh, box, and the organ box. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, so a lot of research, but I did not was not actually part of a writer's group. I would have loved doing that. And what I would say is that the writing of the novel, once I got started, was pretty easy. The real challenge for me was writing number two. And uh, I've got several started, but I, um, you know, I, I, I guess the siren call of uh, a book that's, that, that somebody will actually buy ahead of time and pay you for. Yeah. Is, uh, maybe that's just an excuse. But I do hope, uh, the, you know, I do hope that to get back to fiction writing. That's 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 my plan for the next decade. But the Hermit is out already. The book's already out and available. Yeah, the, Hermit, the Hermit's been out for about 10 years now. Oh, 10 years. OK. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like I say, it's not easy. It's, it, if, if it was easy, everybody would do it. But yeah. uh, it can take years between books like that because of the amount of effort it takes. Uh, and yet, in the meantime, you know, you've done 32 books or 31 cookbooks or food books. Um, and so those seem to come a little easier and roll off. But um, again, it comes back to, for me, this this question of um, new recipes. Each time you do a book, you've got to introduce at least you may be able to recycle some earlier ideas but you've got to come up with new ideas also for each book how do you do that how do you keep it fresh for you well that's a great question so the first thing whenever i start a new book is i pack a suitcase and my books are always uh field research driven uh so uh you know for example when i wrote uh barbecue bible i traveled around the world and visited countries on six continents uh when i worked on pro uh, on uh project smoke you know, I packed a suitcase. I went to the UK. I went to Scandinavia. I went to Mexico, countries where uh, Italy, northern Italy, countries where there's a real uh, profound tradition of um, of smoking. And, you know, Julia Child once gave me some great advice that I think has kind of helped me keep it fresh. And she said, pick a topic that is of really broad interest, you know, that a lot of people will be interested in, but then take an approach that you and only you can do. So for me, you know, for the last uh, 25 years, that's been barbecue. And certainly everybody is interested in barbecuing and grilling and barbecue sauces and indoor grilling and, you know, you name it. But the approach that I have chosen to take, uh, I guess, first of all, it's, it's the global approach, you know. Yeah. Probably nobody else would have been uh, crazy enough to do all the traveling and spend all the money on trips traveling i have to do my research you have to love the travel yeah and i guess also you know i've been called kind of the intellectual of barbecue or the guy that gave barbecue a college education and i think <laughs> that's, that's my read college you know thinking <laughs> about trying to understand the, uh, the the philosophy and theories and intellectual underpinnings of live fire cooking well reed should be very proud of you you it's kind of like a distinguished visiting uh alum they should have you back and give you some kind of uh, honorary doctorate yeah i think that's after i make uh, a large enough contribution to the alumni uh yeah, so. that, yeah. well that's usually the prelude to that yeah <laughs> but but well but this raises a, another question for me because you know pizza quest is all about sort of this something that we always talk to people who are driven yeah. by something that that compels them to do this difficult task, which is, in your case, getting on the road and writing relentlessly. Um, what is it about barbecue or cooking over fire or this subject that you've picked, this broad subject that you've sort of thrown yourself into the deep end with that is so compelling? What, what drives you to keep going deeper and learn more uh, about the subject itself and then share that with others? Oh, man. Well, there's so many things. Um and it's everything from uh, it answers all of my intellectual needs. I mean, for, first of all, I believe most foods, in, including pizza, by the way, taste better cooked with live fire than they do in a stove or an oven or on the stovetop or by boiling. Uh, and I'm very much driven by taste. I mean, I love I love to eat. You know, I, I just I, I when I plan trips, there are trips planned around eating. It helps. Uh, it helps to love food. Yes. I also love fire. I love making fires, playing with fires. I have to confess now, uh, when I was growing up, 
I was a bit of a pyromaniac. Uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes got me into. Now trouble. we're getting to the heart of it here. Yeah. <laughs> I used to build fire. model airplanes and model uh, ships. You know, uh -huh. remember all the the, the 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 models back then? Yeah. And I would I would stuff them with firecrackers and oh douse them, you know, with a uh, flammable uh, model <laughs> airplane glue, and then set them on fire. So it would take me days and days to build these models wow. and fire kits to blow them up. But uh, that was uh, that's uh, so I, funny. And I think I was, in a, I was in a model rocket club. Did, did, we did the same thing. You know, we'd, uh, we'd build these little rockets and, and then put this fuel pack inside and see how high we can get it to uh, to fly. Oh, absolutely. Did you see that wonderful movie, by the way? I think it was uh, September or October. And it was uh, about that that craze. And, you know, back when was it? Would have been in the 60s or? Yeah. Yeah. Of uh, people making model. Uh, uh, that was when it was in the 60s. Yeah. Yeah, I have my hey. neighbor, my next door neighbor was really <laughs> drove that. I used to just tag along with them because they were really into it. And his his ambition was was to be an astronaut. Um, and uh, he didn't make it, but he became a pilot, a jet wow. pilot, and fought in uh, in Vietnam and ended up becoming a war hero there by wow. saving. People. So, but he there. But uh, anyway, that was all these little things that happened to you in childhood that kind of show up later on in maybe transmuted form in, in this case in the form of great food for for you but the fire I, seems to be at the heart, heart of it which is kind of the parallel thing with with pizza quest because when we gather uh, people together for pizza events we've had you know like these outdoor events where the folks who own wood-fired ovens all come together you know and the thing that we noticed was that they we, we feel like we're part of a tribe of, i call them fire freaks uh and uh there's something that that it's kind of like finding kindred spirits who all are driven by this love of fire. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, Freud called it, called it uh, sublimation, you know, and the, the idea that you take an unhealthy primal urge and you find a way to make it socially acceptable. But yeah, right. it, is, it is true. If you think about it, you, you know, you simmer a great pot of chili, you bake a lo great loaf of bread indoors, and you're pretty much by yourself. However, you light a barbecue grill, everybody gathers around it, and it's an instant party. And I think that it comes from a, a, a very deep primal uh, memory, you know, back when we were uh, homo erectus and we lived in a scary world where uh, come darkness, you know, there were predatory animals, you were always hungry, it was dark, you were frightened. And when you could make a fire and cook communally around it, Yes. That brought you not only comfort, but survival. And I think that we subliminally remember that. And uh, it's one reason why people are so attracted to barbecue. You know, that makes total sense. Um, Hold on one minute. I had an alarm set for something, and that's going to okay. be an irritating uh, noise. I apologize. It's okay. So, And while he's taking care of that, um, you know, okay. uh, I was going to mention that... Uh, the word that keeps that kept coming up when we would gather people together is a sense of feeling that we were part of a tribe, some kind of a huh? tribe, and then that's a very primal word, tribe. Yes. Um, yes. And, but yet it would come up, you know, unsolicited. I mean, all of a sudden, everyone said, you know, we feel like we're we're we, we found our tribe would be yeah. a common phrase. Yeah. Um, and and, uh, and and when you talk about what you were just saying, it it just kind of rang all those same tunes. Absolutely. And I, and I found with my travels and barbecue, you know, if I were to take an Indonesian satay master next to an Indian kebab wala, next to a Turkish shish kebab guy, next to an Argentinian asador, and even if they didn't speak uh, a word of the other's language, they would be communicating in five seconds. I mean, yeah. it's it's that universal. Exactly. Well, before we run out of time completely, um, and, you know, I want to ask you a few questions about, get more specific about barbecue. I mean, people who read your books, I've read your books, probably already know this. Things have changed 25 years ago. A much smaller group of people could answer these questions. Now everybody thinks of themselves as a grill master or a barbecue, you know, expert. So some of our listeners may already know these, but for people that are new to the game and and uh, are have ordered the barbecue Bible because they didn't get one of the first... 3 million copies that were sold, but now that's now that it's coming out in the 25th anniversary edition um, that um, let, let's just go back to some fundamentals. So, so I, I see them 
on uh, one of the pages here, you've got the five most frequently asked questions about, uh, and you call them the, the barbecue Bible, but really grilling and barbecue are kind of two different aspects of the same style. So we'll get into that in a second, but here's some of the questions that came up. Maybe you could just do a, qu a couple quick, uh, uh, sort of a lightning round of, of answers to this. And then those who want more can get the book. It, you know, there's no point in us trying to recreate the book here for you. It's all in the book and it's a fun book to have and to read. So one of the questions was, what sort of grill should I buy? And uh, and are there sort of some some real quick guidelines for people to, to steer people in the right direction? Absolutely. Well, it really kind of depends on your personality. I mean, I would say my baseline is that you should start with a charcoal kettle grill. Why charcoal? Because if you can learn to grill over charcoal, you can grill on anything. And if you start with a gas grill, which is convenient. I own gas grills. I use them. Uh, there's a certain skill set that you'll be lacking. The other advantage of a charcoal grill is that you can do every all five methods of live fire cooking on a charcoal grill. That is direct grilling, indirect grilling, smoking, spit roasting, and what I call caveman grilling, where you lay the food directly on the fire. Wow. That I, you get to get into some of that caveman style in the, on the on the TV show. Oh, uh, absolutely! I love caveman grilling. It's probably my favorite way of uh, grilling. First of all, because the food is so incredibly flavorful. And second of all, I mean, just I love the reaction when people watch me take a two inch thick porterhouse steak and lay it on the coals. They think, yeah. oh, my God, that thing must have cost 100 bucks. He's not going to put it. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. And, and then he does it. And then they taste it. And it just and, uh, you know, it's funny. I did that. I, I did a TV show in Italy a few years ago uh, for the Italian Food Network. And I did uh, a uh, bistec alla Fiorentina caveman style. And oh, wow. man, I, I thought they were going to lynch me, but yeah, uh, right. they wound up enjoying it. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, uh, one of my favorite restaurants in Providence when I when I lived up there uh, was Al Forno. Is Al Forno, and and they they were famous for their with their their caveman steak. They were just yeah, they called it dirty steak. And I'm so dirty, glad you mentioned them yeah. because for the last uh, 40 minutes, I've been trying to figure out how to segue to your specialty but there is in barbecue bible uh four pages devoted to grilled pizza uh -huh. uh, which was invented by uh, uh george. George, Joanna george at al forno yes. and just to give people a little tease uh this is not done on a pizza stone you actually lay the pizza dough directly on the grill grate and it puffs yes. and blisters and chars and there's a certain special sequence you have to use to layer the ingredients on but it's really pretty magical I love it. And I got to learn how to make it directly from George and uh, and started to kind of play with it myself. And but but because when I was living there, it was so convenient. Just go over there, sit at the bar and order a grilled pizza. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's 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 just another kind of pizza that takes you to a different place. Uh, so, yes, thank you. And and uh, that's where I learned about the dirty steak, too. And so and I made them myself and I love doing it that way. Uh what's so counterintuitive is that you think you're going to ruin it, but you just get it off the coals and shake off all the coals and, you know, yep. and it works. So totally, totally different grilled, a grilled T-bone and a, a caveman T-bone, same cut of meat, completely different experience. Okay. So, so in, and of course in the barbecue Bible, is that covered? Is that technique uh, uh, explained in there? I believe it is. Yeah, I believe we've got a dirty steak recipe in there. And maybe on the and on the on the series on the new series, maybe certainly some... on the new series and fan, fantastic method for vegetables, corn, uh, pumpkins, peppers, onions. Uh, there's almost nothing that I haven't cooked on the coals at some point. By the way, including flatbread, and that is really interesting too. Love it. Um, okay, another question, and this is kind of the million dollar question because it can it can. It could be great, uh, you know, argument topics is what's the difference between grilling and barbecuing? I mean, I know people, myself included, who get really uh, we get we get upset when somebody refers to, you know, their grilling as barbecuing. But it was, and they seem to be two distinct, different, uh, you know, art forms. What what do you how would you define the difference between grilling and barbecuing? Totally different. Both use live fire, but in very different ways. Grilling is a direct high heat method. Uh, used for quick cooking tender foods. You grill a hamburger, you grill a steak, you grill a fish filet, you grill an ear on the cob. Barbecue is an indirect, low heat, slow cooking method that always involves wood smoke. So true barbecue would be 
Carolina style pulled, pulled pork, Texas style mm. smoked brisket, mm -hmm. uh, barbecued, uh, barbecued chicken. Uh, the operative words are slow, indirect, and especially smoke. Grilling, you may or may not have smoked. With true barbecue, you must have smoke or it's not barbecue. Interesting. Okay. And then, and of course, that the word barbecuing has become so, you know, generic now that it, it, get, it sometimes gets used incorrectly to refer to, to, to grilling. Correct. Uh, but, less, so now, less so now. When I wrote Barbecue Bible, uh, you know, I'd say 1% out of 100 knew the difference. But now, you know, we've become so sophisticated in the arts of live fire cooking. I think most people, most people would get that concept. And that, and a lot of that is the 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 evolution of the whole, you know, genre from in the 25 years since this book came out, you know, the world has changed. Certainly the, the American culinary scene and understanding has changed. And, and the book is a big part of that is in, in advancing the understanding of these concepts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, that was, and, and that's, I think we're dealing with a different, in a sense, a different uh, marketplace than we were 25 years ago, because you're, you, 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 you've got an educated group of people now. So you, in order to wow them, you've got to come up with something that keep, keeps taking them to new places where they've never been before. Um, well, that's the, that's the fun thing about the, uh, the field of live fire cooking. You know, there's always something new to say about it. There are new things to discover. Um, I actually just started work on a new book uh, that is a little bit, it's, it started on the grill, but in fact, it's uh, taken a different direction. It's a book on, uh, it's, it's called Project Plancha, and it's a book about cooking on hot iron. Ah. Hot iron you might have on a grill, but it also yeah. includes uh, hot iron that might be in a freestanding grill, like uh, the Blackstone. Uh, Weber's just come out with one. Mm -hmm. Traeger's just come out with them. And I think it's going to be a very big trend. It's a very big trend already in Europe. And I'm excited, you know, because that's, I, yeah. I know barbecue inside and out, but uh, but plancha grilling, you know, I've got a I've got a year now to learn about a new way of cooking. Exactly, it opens up a whole new avenue, which means it gives you some more some more grist for the mill to be able to write about. You bet. <laughs> okay, couple quick. Well, let's get you out with a couple of quick ones here. Um, charcoal, gas, or wood? Wood is my favorite fuel because it delivers both heat and wood smoke. Uh, charcoal is my second favorite fuel. Uh, what I used last night, because it's, uh, you know, you can do all five methods of live fire cooking on it. It's very easy to smoke with a charcoal grill. Uh, gas is my third favorite method, um, only because it's sort of delivers less flavor. But, you know, I uh, might use that tonight because I might be in a hurry and, you know, just want the convenience of getting my uh, dinner cooked. Uh, yeah, and there's certainly so something very convenient to be able to just, you know, fire up the, the gas and have heat without having to build a fire. Um, but again, for fire freaks, and you know, the, 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 a lot of times it's really about the wood and it's about the flames and the fire. Uh, yeah. So, okay, how do you smoke on a gas grill? Well, on a gas grill, it's a little bit tricky. First of all, it depends on your gas grill. Uh, but um, some grills, gas grills have dedicated smoker boxes with a burner underneath, and you would fill those with wood chips or chunks. Let's say if you have like a pretty standard uh, Weber, let's say a Weber Genesis, you know, which is a, a pretty common grill. Uh, underneath the grates, there are inverted V-shaped flavorizer bars or some models oh, yeah. have yeah. Uh, have perforated metal plates or some, some of the older models have lava stones. And yeah. if you put wood chips or chunks, uh, wood chunks between those flavorizer bars, wood chips on lava under the food, you can also get uh, somewhat mm. of a smoke flavor. Another trick, although it involves charcoal anyway, is to uh, light a, half a dozen charcoal briquettes in a skillet and then put uh, smoking wood, wood chunks or chips on that and put that on the grate alongside your, uh, your food. Uh, but please know that with a gas grill, you're never going to get the kind of deep sonorous uh, smoke flavor that you would get uh, with a charcoal grill or a, a stick burner, a wood burning smoker, you're kind of basically jerry rigging it to do to do something that it wasn't designed to do. Exactly. All right. This last question. Uh, by, and then, by, by the way, if I may make one exception to that rule, there is one gas grill that is expressly designed for smoking. It's the Kalamazoo uh, 
a, a hybrid fire grill. And on that grill, you can actually close the lid. Now, most gas grills have a big two inch gap uh, between the back of the lid and the, the uh -huh. uh, firebox. And the smoke just pours out of that. With the Kalamazoo, there's a vent at the top you can close. Uh, it's not an inexpensive grill, but uh, it is a gas grill that lets you smoke. And it traps that, that smoke in there. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know about that. That's good to know. Um, okay, now, the, and then, of course, this is from a, a, a list of what, what you identified as the five most frequently asked questions. Uh, so the fifth one of these is, why won't my ribs come out, fall off the bone tender? In other words, it sounds like a plea for, how can I make my ribs fall off the bone tender? Well, first of all, uh, I think that's a common a misconception that a rib should be fall off the bone tender and it shouldn't it should have a little chew to it that's why god gave you teeth and <laughs> a great barbecued rib you know it, it it will not be fall off the tender uh, fall off uh, the bone tender ribs tend to be either braised in the oven or boiled first before grilling yes. both of which are uh you know heresy in my barbecue world <laughs> All right, that's good to know. I was because that that was it would have been sort of the follow up question to it because so many people have that technique where you know yeah before I do my my ribs I I I, I boil them first or I steam them first or whatever. Um, so so number one is the goal isn't necessarily to have fall off the bone tender. The what is the goal into making sort of the the ideal spare ribs or back baby back ribs. Okay, so the perfect rib, in my mind, first of all, you look at it, it's got a beautiful bark, a crust on the outside. Yeah. Uh, second of all, you cut one rib off. Uh, well, you should be able to tear it apart with resistance. It should not fall apart. Mm. That's number two. If you were to cut it, you would see a clearly delineated smoke ring, a little subcutaneous layer of... Uh, of reddish pink right you know, beneath, the sur beneath the surface. That's the result of a chemical reaction that takes place between the hemoglobin in the meat and the, uh, the smoke. Uh, you taste it. Uh, I mean, first of all, it should taste smoky. It should taste meaty. It should taste spicy because those are the three sort of essential uh, flavor components of a great rib. Uh, it should be, uh, it, it shouldn't be chewy, but it shouldn't be soft and mushy either. It should have a little bit of resistance to it. And it should be so delicious that you want to go back instantly and have a second one and a third and a fourth and a fifth. There, that's the key to the whole thing. Yeah. Well, that, in other words, it's, it becomes, you become obsessed with it. And that is kind of what, what this show is about. Pizza Quest, you are, you know, you represent an entire category of people, a, a global community of people, a tribe, as we can keep using that word, of people who are obsessed with this, with the the outcomes of cooking over live fire. And Stephen, thank you so much for sharing all this, for your great books, for your, um, you know, wonderful TV shows, and for just keeping us all, you know, on, on the path with you in your quest for, for the exploration of what it, well, the possibilities, all the possibilities of live fire cooking. So Stephen Reichlin, thank you so much for being on Pizza Quest today. And uh, and thank all of you for joining us. We just scratched the surface by touching on these FAQs. But for more deeper answers, go to the Barbecue Bible, the 25th anniversary. Is it a new edition, totally new edition with revised copy on it, Steve? Uh, there's some revised copy. There's a, uh, a handsome cover, which is certainly way more handsome than the original cover. <laughs> We've actually had five the benefits of success. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, good. And if people want more information, barbecuebible.com is the website. Thank uh, you. For that. Up and Smoke newsletter you can sign up with for free. And um, I'm Stephen Reichlin on social media. And Peter, I, as I said at the beginning of the outset of this interview, I'm a huge fan of your work and your books. And it's a great thank honor for me to have been on uh, on the show. So thank well, you. We love having you. And don't forget, folks, Planet Barbecue on your PBS stations launching. Well, by the time you hear this, it will have been launched. So time to follow up with that as well. Stephen, continued success. Uh, let let us know when you've got the next book coming out, and uh, we'll get you back if you can, if you can join us. I would like that. Thanks. Grill on. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us. We'll see you at the next episode of Pizza Quest. <laughs>